Yeah, that's, that's me. Um, that's me too, and that's my son Jesse, who is considerably taller than that now. He would not like that we're showing that picture, so anyway. Um, thank you, thank you. It is uh, uh, an honor and a privilege, and um, I'm absolutely delighted to be here. As I look around and see your faces, I can't believe that some of you are actually graduating. Um, Some of you were just starting to write well, so it's, <laughs> wow. Um, well, uh, let me be one of the very first to uh, congratulate you on almost graduating. Uh, two weeks and a day until commencement. Uh, you got a lot of work to do in two weeks and a day, I bet. Uh, I have a lot of grading to do. Uh, May 19th is also my birthday, so you are all invited. I will, I'm throwing a party on the quad. Uh, wear funny hats, you know I will, so I'm looking forward to uh, seeing you all there. Uh, what, I'd like to, uh, what I'd like to do with you this morning, well, what I would really love to do, I won't, but I would, what I would really love to do is give you like a straight political science lecture. Uh, most of you, for some reason, did not become political science majors. Uh, we could have a great 40 minutes or so on, you know, the dynamics of executive legislative relationships in 12 different democracies around the world. I think that would be great. Uh, in fact, I can see some people who really want to do that, some of our, our political science majors. Um, but I shall resist that temptation. Uh, what I'm going to do instead is uh, do what maybe your professors have been doing for about four years already, and that's attempt to tell you some things that you already know, <laughs> but, 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 but repackaged in new and interesting ways. So that's, that's the plan. New any, anyway, and maybe interesting. And I'm going to uh, say you already know these things because really you've been sort of breathing them for, for four years or so. Uh, you've been living them just by virtue of being here at Gordon. So these are sort of the things that you already know, but maybe you don't know that you know. Or maybe these are things that you already know, but it's just helpful to have them pointed out, uh, to sort of crystallize what's, what's the things we've been talking about for four years. Uh, they're sort of in the DNA of the place, and they're sort of things you might pick up without noticing. That doesn't matter, but these are touchstones, distinctives, that make the place tick uh, academically. Right now, I'm sure you seniors cannot imagine giving Gordon College any more money. <laughs> but uh, in about 10 years from now, I promise you that when the, you get the appeal letter from the Alumni Association saying, please consider us, it is these things that I'm talking about which will be what makes you think twice before you put it in the recycling bin. Right? It is these sorts of distinctives, I think, which are probably as important, maybe even more important, than the specific content you maybe received uh, when all these professors very earnestly gave you all these, this, this material. Okay, what are these things? Uh, I, have, I have three. Other professors might have a slightly different list, maybe add a couple things, maybe combine some things. Uh, so there'll be a little bit of difference among the faculty as to what these things are. And yet, I suspect that there's going to be a surprising amount of agreement among the faculty about what these Gordon touchstones are. Uh, that said, it's not, a, it's not a comprehensive list. Okay, first one, the uh, Ken Olson Science Center. I was trying to think last night, I couldn't recall, you seniors, when you arrived at Gordon, was the Ken Olson Science Center already built? Yeah. It was already built, okay. Um, so then you would not know that before the uh, construction people put up the very last beam, apparently this is a construction thing, that before you, they put in the very last beam, <laughs> they put it on the quad. And what we were all encouraged to do was to show up, and uh, it was a huge piece of iron, like, I don't know, 30 feet long, something like that. And we were all encouraged to show up with our Sharpies and, and like put a message on there for like future generations or something. 
And it was kind of, it was kind of neat, like a time, a time capsule or something. Um, and people came and they wrote really thoughtful <coughs> messages like, Steve and Beth forever. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, and you know that, that the very next week, uh, Steve and Beth broke up and in 100 years, when they uncover that beam, it's gonna be very awkward for everybody. Um, <laughs> But, but those were the sorts of things people wrote. Uh, you had social science faculty and humanities faculty coming and writing things like, how come the science people get this nice great building and I'm still teaching in Chase Basement? Uh, that sort of thing. Uh, <laughs> well, people came and wrote all sorts of things. And it was, uh, it was, it was a kind of a neat thing. It was sort of a community building thing and whatever. And, um, and so I thought about what I was gonna write. Um, well, first I wrote Paul and Jen forever. Of course, Jen is here, I think, so I should say that. Um, and then I wrote the phrase, Semper Reformanda. Now, Semper Reformanda, do I, if I had, my, I could put it up there, type it up so you would know how it's spelled. Somebody, though, what does Semper Reformanda mean? Anybody? Yeah. Always reforming. That barely helps. What does always reforming mean? Come on, you can put up your hand. There's only 400 of your, no, 150 of your closest friends here, so. Always reforming. Try it. If someone start it off, Holland, I'm going to ask you. What does always reforming, <laughs> you're sitting in the front row trying to distract me, so this is my... I, I'm, how would you begin to talk about what always reforming means? Um, possibly just maintaining. Always shaping or shift, you sound like, an, you know, like you're shape-shifting or something. But does it mean not standing for anything? Yeah. Yeah, that might be a way to begin. Does anyone know where the term comes from? Chris, you said you knew what it meant. It's Latin. Yeah, it's Latin. We're making great progress here. This is awesome. <laughs> yeah. Well, it sounds a little like a dialectic concept. Uh, there often is a dialectic process to it, yeah? Right. It... it, it probably originated as an anthem of the Reformation, or the motto of the Reformation, especially associated with Luther, right? Although it also became a very important part of the, uh, the Vatican II process in the Catholic Church. So we heard about the, that phrase also on, on the Catholic side. Um, it's, uh, it means constantly being willing to reevaluate, constantly being willing to re-examine, our doctrines, our beliefs, our practices, uh, in ways that our, our, our faith is consistently biblical, that is true to the source, but also is, is relevant, that it speaks to our culture, right, in ways that uh, uh, there would be the dialectic process, I think, that there's ways in which we we're constantly re-examining re what we believe to be true for the sake of the gospel. Um, do you see why someone might want to, like me, might want to write this on this metal beam, which is still it's up there somewhere. I don't know where it went in the building. Why it would be important to maybe put this on a, on the metal beam and have that on the Science Center? Because science, faith in science, we talk about that a lot. You can see how the Semper Reformanda process would be important in a science building, right? Yeah, nod your head. Okay. 
Why then, when I told my good friends and colleagues, Tim Sherritt and Ruth Malconian, did they roll their eyes? Uh, Ruth actually used body language. <sighs> That's what she did. Uh, I don't know. I don't know what, what that was about. I, there was a little bit of uh, uh, exasperation. But, um, of course, what I'm suggesting is that this is one of those Gordon things that you may be picked up without knowing it. Now, maybe you do know it. Um, I don't know if we actually come out and say in our classes, be always reforming. Uh, but I think it's one of those Gordon things which appears in many different disciplines at Gordon. This, this way of thinking critically, not accepting things at face value, digging deeper, and even constantly re-evaluating what it is we thought we knew. That's, I, think, I think that's very healthy. That's a good part of the reason why I came to Gordon and why I'm still here. Um, as, as of the afternoon on May 19th, uh, that is after commencement, you will be uh, among the most highly educated people on the planet. No kidding, I looked it up. You will have more education than 93.3% of the population of the world. Right? This is staggering. This is a staggering responsibility, right? You have, that, you have more education than over 90% of the entire world, uh, world's responsibility. But what is that education? Well, I suggest to you that what you have learned is not simply a body of, a, a body of truths that can never be touched. It's not as though you've been walking around Gordon for four years with a briefcase, and all these professors have been putting bits of knowledge in it, and now the briefcase is full, and you're ready to go on out into the world, right? It's not like that. It's not as though like, you're leaving here with a purse full of facts. It's not as though we've been, all us faculty have been pouring stuff into there, and now, we, now you have received truth. And so now you're ready to take that and go into, in, into wherever it is you're going to go. Rather, what I think, or what I hope, or what I pray, is that what you've found what you've encountered is a way of interacting with knowledge, a way of, of approaching truth rather than capturing truth. Truth is not the sort of thing you can capture and put in a briefcase, right? Truth is something you approach, that you dialogue with, that you engage with. And that means, that means questioning it. And um, it's become almost trite to say that what you learn at college are not answers, but questions. And perhaps this frustrated you, because I know I'm bad at this. When people ask me a question, I just respond with another question. Um, and yet, I think that's very true. Uh, and I'm suggesting that this is one of the great successes of Gordon. We try to model how to ask questions. And both within the church and outside the church, that's a habit which is not cultivated enough. So, uh, how do I know that, I, that, this is, that this is going on in the Gordon, or among Gordon students? Because even though you haven't even graduated yet, you still have two weeks in a day, um, half of you are already taking your education apart. Right? Half of you, well, probably more than half, I hope more than half, are actually already saying, could there be another way we could have understood or approached the problem of poverty? Could there be another way than what we did in this class to, that I could have analyzed that novel? What's our whole model, our whole approach? Should we have gone at it this way? Right? I'm, gonna, I'm thinking of running a business. Should I have really approached the business from, should I have been taught this way? I wonder what this prof would have said if I had pushed on that point more. That sort of questioning is, is I think, uh, uh, part and parcel of what we, try have, we have tried to, uh, we've tried to accomplish here at, at, at Gordon. Um, more important than understanding what I think about legislative executive relations in 12 democracies, I'd be more interested to know how you are, would tackle that question of how do you approach legislative executive democracies thinking about questions of, democracy, of 
justice, authority, uh, um, um, legitimacy. That's what, those are the sorts of buzzwords in political theory. Those are the broad approaches rather than the details of legislative executive uh, democracies, uh, relations and democracies. The truths that your faculty believe that they have passed on to you, many of you are already interpreting them and reinterpreting them uh, in ways that will make your professor's head spin if you told them, right? Maybe wait before you tell them, actually. Uh, what I'm saying is that you guys are, uh, and this is what should happen, semper reformanda, what should happen is that the things that you have taken from your classwork, that you have taken from your coursework, that you have taken out from your professors, you cannot accept and just hold it as though this is a gospel truth, as though it is something which um, must be kept pure from the rest of your life. You've got to take it, and you've got to run with it, and it's going to change. And even some of your professors might wince as you do that, because what I say to you, I really hold dear. But for the professor, they have to let go, and the student has to run with it, and even challenge what it is they've learned here. And that's a very good process, semper reformanda. So, um, I think that's one of the things that is, uh, uh, that is distinctive, that is one of these touchstones. What you got when you came to Gordon was an invitation to participate in a tradition of questioning. Uh, questions that are vital, questions that are vital for the church. Questions that might make your parents tremble, but questions that are absolutely necessary for the growth of the church and for the continued relevance of the gospel. The faith needs to be constantly uh, uh, reforming, and that's difficult and occasionally dangerous. I hope that for all of our talk about the Gordon bubble, right, we all know what we mean when we talk about the Gordon bubble, I hope you've had a chance to discover that because of the questioning or the probing of foundations which is present at Gordon, Gordon might not always be safe, even though it's good. It might always, not always be safe, and that's quite appropriate for a college or a university. Um, and your professors know it, they respect it, even though they're scared about it, uh, and yet it's vital to the Gordon experience. You can understand why admissions wouldn't put that as part of the Gordon experience day. Come to Gordon, it's not safe. But, <laughs> but yet, I think that's what's going on when we talk about the tradition of intellectual reflection at, at, at Gordon. Okay. That's that first, how are we doing? We got, yeah, we're good. That's the first broad touchstone, Gordon distinctive. For the second one, uh, I'm gonna, I wanna tell you a little story about graduate school. I went to graduate school right, right out of college. Uh, my wife and I went to um, Dalhousie University for uh, our master's degrees, which is in Halifax, uh, Nova Scotia. Uh, there, um, I had a friend, his name was Bob, he was British, and we thought he was bonkers because he was working on his second PhD. And here I am, just out of college, thinking, master's degree, I'll never be able to pull it off. And he's on his second PhD, within the same discipline. Like I had brains spilling out all over the place. It was just nuts. Okay, what had happened was this. He had done a degree in... Uh, international relations at some British university. Standard degree, uh, wrote a fine dissertation, was happy with his PhD. And then he discovered postmodernism. And uh, it was really interesting to talk with him about it because he wouldn't even say it that way. He would say, postmodernism discovered him. And I'm going, really? Um, <laughs> What's this so, what was so interesting to me was the language he used. He would say, I saw the light. Right? And here I have my little Christian antenna on. and going, really? You saw the light? Uh, yes, and he would actually say, I, it, it was a whole life change. Right? He, was like a, he was like an evangelical postmodernist. It was a whole life change. I was converted to a new way of thinking. He actually used the word conversion. And I'm going... Wow, this is really wild. Um, this was my first foray out of a Christian college. I went to a Christian college in Canada, 
And uh, uh, this was my first foray into like secular political science. I was the only Christian in the department. They had all sorts of weird stereotypes. Um, but uh, uh, trying, to figure, trying to figure this guy out was a great challenge. And of course, what he did, he was now a postmodernist, so he deconstructed his own dissertation. And there was nothing left. So he said, I need to do another one. And I'm now going to do it as a postmodern dissertation. And so he did a postmodern uh, uh, take on, I don't know what, remember what his topic was in international relations. So it was a second dissertation in the same field. I couldn't believe it. Now, what I, why I'm telling this story is because I think, for Bob, there was something religious going on, right? And the, the language is what tipped me off. But the fact that you would actually do another dissertation suggests that there's a degree of commitment to this, which is remarkable. Uh, I think in my friend Bob, I could see an indication that for him, at least, postmodernism was making some pretty serious faith claims. And like even things as basic as what do we need to do to be saved, those sorts. For him, postmodernism was functioning as a religion. Um, what it indicated to me and what I learned from Bob was the degree to which, to which there is an element of committed faith at the heart of every theory. And this was, this, was, I, this was one of the things I had sort of always known, but I had never seen it happen right in front of my eyes like this, right? Now, I'll say it again, that there is a degree of committed faith at the heart of every theory. Now, postmodernist analytical tools can be very valuable, right? I've used them. In fact, I've been accused of being a postmodernist because of my use of these tools. But there's a difference there between postmodernism as a tool and postmodernism as a belief system. What's my point? Well, I, I think the example of my friend Bob helps me understand again that old phrase, faith precedes understanding. Um, where do we get that phrase from? Faith precedes, or how about this quote? Um, I believe in order that I may understand. Say Nansam, right? Uh, thank you, whoever you were. Uh, say Nansam. Um, it's, it's an Augustinian type of point, right? Augustine uses it as, as well. So here, and I'm going to get a little philosophical, so bear with me if this is not your usual way of thinking. But here at Gordon, we have something, a lecture series called the Faith Seeking Understanding Lecture Series. <coughs> We have, uh, we have a, a, a program called the Jerusalem and Athens program. Uh, we have, well, my goodness, most of your faculty are Augustinians, at least in practice, if not in name. Um, inside most of your Gordon faculty is a little St. Augustine trying to get out in some way. Uh, it's really neat to see. Um, what this means is that this sort of Augustinian and Selmian vision of faith preceding understanding is so pervasive at Gordon, there's a chance we might miss just how radical and just how countercultural that is. The idea that faith is prior to reason is, I think, uh, 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 a Gordon distinctive. It's a, uh, a radical countercultural statement. Plato, I teach Plato every year, Plato's Republic. My students in the major know you, we read all, the whole of Plato's Republic every year. Plato would not like this. Plato would not like the idea that faith precedes understanding. And neither would Kant. Uh, uh, ironically, my friend Bob, he might understand it, even though he might not like it. Both Platonic philosophy, of, that is the philosophy of the high Greeks, uh, but also the philosophy of the Enlightenment, that is, modernity itself, prefers to see understanding as not preceded by anything. Understanding in modernity is not preceded by anything. Understanding 
stands alone. Uh, and that's reason stands alone. Reason with a capital R. Um, we call this the autonomy of theoretical thought. I'd suggest to you this is a pretended autonomy of theoretical thought. Uh, remember your day, do you, examine life. Are you guys old core or new core? Old core, so you didn't do examine, well maybe some of you did examine life. Well, then maybe you did modernity. You read Descartes at some, at some point? All right, if you didn't read Descartes, um, this summer you should pick up a copy and read him at the beach or somewhere. Because uh, you really do need to read him. Um, what, if you don't know anything else about Descartes, what do you know about Descartes? Give me the, the great Descartes quote. I think, therefore I am, right? Which is this marvelous statement. Uh, imagine Descartes, he's, I don't know, he's sleeping in one morning, and he uh, is lying in bed, and he begins to say, hmm, I wonder if I really exist. Uh, he begins to doubt. This is the Cartesian skepticism. He begins to doubt everything. He doubts that the sky is blue. He doubts that he has a hands. He, does, he doubts that he is a bet. He doubts that, the, that, the, that God exists. He doubts that the universe exists. He doubts everything. This is just skeptical about everything. He says, I need, I don't, it's not, I need, my senses aren't good enough. I need better proof. And so he begins to doubt everything. And once he has doubted everything, what's left? The doubt. What's left? Doubt is left. He says, if I have doubted everything, then there must be a basis thought. Right? There has to be a basis thought. And Descartes is so excited about this, he springs out of bed and says, that's it. I think, therefore, I am. And then on the basis of that, he rebuilds all of reality again. Right? Once he knows that thought is there, he's able to establish, well, then I must exist, and the bed must exist, and I can go have breakfast after all, and this is all wonderful. He's determined that the whole world exists because that thought exists. Um, this is the autonomy of theoretical thought. Thought stands alone. Um, if, on the other hand... <laughs> Faith precedes thought, which is what Augustine said, what Anselm said. We have a conflict between our good friends Descartes and the early church, if faith precedes thought. If we believe in order that we can understand, if the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, then the Cartesian idea that we can find truth using reason alone, begins to break down. So I'm going to suggest the radical idea that reason cannot save us. And this is kind of, it's, it's, it, in some quarters, in some uh, academic situations, uh, that, would be, that would be heresy. Reason cannot provide us with the type of certainty that it claims for itself. In fact, I would submit to you that we may discover that the idea, that that idea, that reason can provide us that sort of certainty, is itself based upon a faith claim that places reason as the most important thing. Right? In other words, it's a type of idolatry. To say that reason is the most important thing and reason can solve all of our dilemmas, right? is a type of idolatry. It's placing our salvation in the wrong place. That does not mean that we should all be irrational, right? I saw the play, uh, the Bacchae, that's last two weeks ago, and that was one of the clear lessons. Uh, do not be cons always totally irrational, because that could lead to all sorts of unspeakable tragedies, right? But, but the life totally committed to reason is a life which is going to break down. And this is, uh, this, is, uh, this is a problem. Um, so the requirement, which is what we also hear, I would even add that the requirement that we need to possess that sort of certainty in order to be entitled to have a belief is a mistake. Does that make sense? The belief that we have to have 
That sort of certainty, the certainty that is associated with that high view of reason, in order to be entitled to have a belief, is a mistake. Things can be true regardless of that high view of reason. Things can be true even if we know they're true from ways other than the scientific method. Sorry, I'm in the Kennelson Science Center, but, right? Right? Van Gogh's Starry Night is true, but you don't necessarily have to use the scientific method to get there. Right? I know that my wife loves me, but I don't use a scientific method to determine that. In fact, she would not like it if I did. Right? Um, I am persuaded that a large part of Christianity, and especially of Protestant Christianity, is suffering from sort of a post-enlightenment hangover, if that makes any sense. Um, where religious belief is seen to be less legitimate because we're holding on to this high view of reason that we've inherited. And it's ironic because this is just at the time that that high view of reason is breaking down thanks to people like my friend Bob. Right? So it's a comment then on what we are entitled to uh, believe. And the further implication of this, of course, is that if we encounter a claim for that high view of certainty, uh, either in the church, or in science, or in politics, or uh, anywhere else, be very careful. Because that sort of certainty, if it arrives, can crush what most requires to be nurtured. So, um, in that way, I'm hostile to that, I'm very hostile to that very high view of what reason is. Now, is this sense of the relationship between faith and learning, which is what we're talking about, relationship between faith and learning, which is sort of a cottage industry at Gordon. Uh, if, 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 is this account of faith and learning that I've sort of briefly laid out here, is it found everywhere at Gordon? Well, certainly not at this level of detail uh, or at this level of abst abstraction. But at Gordon, I think, you may have picked up in the air somewhere uh, that although theory is important, I am a theorist, uh, that although the scientific method is powerful, this whole building is based upon the power of the, or recognizes the power of the scientific method, uh, that analysis and technique are absolutely crucial if we want to be able to uh, describe or depict or explain the world that's not all there is. No, no, that's not all there is. The fear of the Lord is prior to our thinking. And it comes along beside it, and it's there afterwards. For me, this is something that's enormously reassuring. Uh, because it places the life of the mind, which is so important to me, places the life of reason, it places my theory, it places the life of the mind within the context of, well, life, right? We need to place our reason within the context of life rather than the reverse, right? We should be very careful about making life fit into our carefully constructed theories because that can result in um, destruction. Okay, that's the second one. The third one isn't quite so philosophical, so if you didn't understand the second one, don't worry about it. There's no test. Okay. My third point is a little different um, because it's something that you might not know, uh, uh, know as a Gordon thing or as a Gordon distinctive if you go only by your own experience. Um, you might think that it's only you who has... Uh, notice that your professors seem to think that your education uh, involves more than getting the right thoughts in your head. Or that your education is more than getting all properly credentialed for your first professional position. And actually, it's not just professors who are doing this. It's not just professors who seem to have a somewhat wider notion of education than getting these facts in your head. Uh, it's those CSD people, those deans and RDs or whoever, uh, it's those chapel folks who are always bringing speakers in or are, or are uh, organizing study groups for Bible studies or, or who are organizing mission trips. Um, it's even other students, people who challenge you to or stay up late with you to debate predestination or something or, or, or challenge you to be relevant or to get off your butt and do some work or whatever it is. 
Um, all those people are, in some sense, educators. They're educators. And that's professors, CSD folks, other students. They're contributing to the education of the people around them. They're contributing to the education of students. But they're same, they seem to be saying something more. They seem to be saying something about what education is for. There seems to be a wider notion of what education is. Now, not all of these people will have read uh, a book by Nick Wolterstorff called uh, Educating for Shalom. Uh, but I think they could have helped write it, maybe. <coughs> what is shalom? OK, what is shalom, someone? What's a, what's a component to shalom? Shall we say that? Mm -hmm. Full human flourishing. That's often how it's phrased. It, it has something to do with peace. When people say shalom at the end of an email, often they're saying it's peace. Uh, something to do with justice. I mean, we talk about this a lot in my justice class. Um, it has a whole lot to do with a life well lived. Uh, a life of full human flourishing. This third distinctive which I'm putting forward then is that education is for shalom. Despite the fact that we live in Wenham, Massachusetts, which is one of the more beautiful parts of the country, uh, I think we are certainly aware that the world is not as it should be, and that things are broken in some terrible ways. Um, what is the consequence of the education for shalom for the ways that we know the world is broken? Well, I suggest that there's a certain orientation towards praxis here. An orientation towards, uh, towards healing. An orientation to, uh, towards restoring what is broken. So we don't do theory for its own sake. I, I don't do theory for its own sake. I love it. But it has an orientation towards the world. It's a theory that loves the world. Because this is, this is God's world. Um, and I think, I mean, we have whole majors which are explicitly devoted to the social work major, especially de explicitly devoted to the challenges of healing. Uh, but I think you'll find a version of this in every major, in every department. It's something that is sort of in the ethos of what Gordon is. Uh, the details will be different across campus, exactly how we understand what the challenges are, how we go about trying to develop strategies to contribute to the healing of the nation. Um, but I, I, a Gordon education is designed especially to reveal the people, to reveal the places where injustice is taking place, and designed also to consider what is to be done, both in theory and in praxis. So, a large part of education, then, is about doing justice. It's more than that, though. Uh, it's more than doing justice narrowly considered. If, if shalom is full human flourishing, then that means it's also about um, establishing the conditions for righteousness. Sounds pretty theological, but... Um, but to establish the situations of full human flourishing is more than just fixing what's broken. It's also putting forward positive things, positive... Um, 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 um. It's about beauty. So we need, for full human flourishing, we need our artists. For full human flourishing, for shalom, we need our poets, we need our writers. We need all those people who hang out at the Barrington Center. We also need our engineers, right? We need our business managers. We need our educators. Because education is for full human flourishing. And we need those people from all those different majors to contribute to shalom. That's what education is for at a place like Gordon. So is this, do we do art for art's sake? Well, maybe if you understand art in the right way, I would think you do art for beauty's sake. You do art for God's sake. You do art for God's sake. <laughs> uh, what this does is it gives a purpose, it gives a focus to our education, which may be, uh, which is, is maybe as important 
No, it is. This focus of our education is as important as the education itself. Education for shalom, that's the third Gordon distinctive. It's something in the air here. Some of you may know that three weeks ago we had a visit from the accreditation people, NIOSC, it's an unfortunate acronym. NIOSC were here. So some of you maybe met with some of these people. Uh, most, of you, most of you knew that it was, uh, uh, that it was going on, I think. Um, these NIOSC people, one of the things they mentioned in their comments was there seems to be such a remarkable unity here on mission things. They disagree about all sorts of other things, but in terms of the overall mission, it's remarkable how they get along. Some of the people here from religious institutions, like the president of St. Anselm's, they can understand what was going on. People who came from secular schools, no idea. It's just kind of spooky. <laughs> well, I think that spookiness may be the point, right? That sort of unity of vision what, uh, is, is what uh, you can take with you as you move into your first year after college. Three points, then, to recap. Actually, I should ask you. Semper reformanda, faith precedes reason, faith precedes understanding, and educating for shalom. Thank you very much. Have a good day.